Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Haywood. I'm the Managing Director of Advanced Oxford. We are a science, technology, and innovation-focused business group working across the whole of Oxfordshire. And I'm delighted to be here to moderate this discussion this morning, which I think is very much going to build on what we've already heard from the panel that Barbara moderated earlier, uh, but also some of the research that Sue has just been talking about. So we're really going to try and explore the issue of clustering, um, what opportunities it brings, how we build super clusters, and how we can use those to encourage innovation and convergence. And in order to do that, I've got a really fantastic, and I'm going to note all female, which is wonderful to see, <laughs> panel. <laughs> And I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves to you. So um, starting, uh, if I may, uh, closest to me, uh, Kristin Ann. Good morning. Um, in a typical year, 43 days per person are lost to poor health. Uh, I have spent my career um, approaching that problem of improving health from many different angles. Started as a doctor, I've worked in med tech and pharma, worked in strategy for life science companies and health systems. And I'm now leading the Cambridge Academic Health Science Centre. And I think it's testament to the importance of uh, place and successful clusters that part of that remit is thinking for my members of the universities and the trusts and the scientific institutes is thinking about how to create and foster the Cambridge life science ecosystem in general and also the Cambridge Biomedical Campus, which for those who don't know it, is a um, pretty unique place where we have, I think, a combination of threes at the moment, three NHS trusts, three global uh, multinational life science companies, and three large uh, research institutions, including the Laboratory of Metabology, University of Cambridge, and Cancer Research UK. Thank you. Isabel. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Isabel Stephen. I'm Executive Director for Strategy, Performance and Engagement at UK Research and Innovation. Uh, UK Research and Innovation is the seven research councils Innovate UK uh, and Research England. Um, we fund about £8 billion worth of research uh, innov and innovation projects every year. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be here today because um, it, it, clusters are really important. It's a really important way of driving growth. Um, and I'm interested to get into the conversation. <clears throat> Sharon. Thank you. Um, I'm from Astroscale UK and uh, probably one of the examples on the panel of a company that's benefited from being in a cluster. I think I have one of the coolest jobs ever. But um, <laughs> what we're doing at the moment, for those of you who don't know, is that we are designing spacecraft that will capture space debris and that will dock with client satellites to either service them, refuel them, uh, repurpose them, or remove them to clear the orbital highways for safe, sustainable uh, growth in space. And Catherine? So I thought I had the coolest job, but <laughs> <laughs> you do, right? Um, but so, yeah, so I'm Catherine Morgan. I'm um, head of high growth and entrepreneurs at Barclays. Um, what we are really motivated about, both through the, the Barclays business team and our Eagle Labs team, is helping support growth in the UK through the startup and scale up sectors. Um, and I think the reason we're so motivated about it is if you look at some of the data from the Scale Up Institute, who say 0.6% of SMEs are generating 50% of the turnover at 1.3 trillion. If it's by influencing a small proportion relatively of the economy, you can drive a lot more growth. And I think what I'm really interested to talk about is what are the anecdotes we hear from our entrepreneurs and innovators we're working with, but also what we're trying to do through our Eagle Labs. So I'll be talking about that. Fantastic. We're going to kick off by talking a little bit about what clusters actually are and what makes a successful cluster. Um, and I think one of the things we've all been reflecting on in preparation for this panel is that a cluster is something that is very much in the eye of the beholder. So for some people, it could be at the level of a building. For some, it might be at the level of uh, a science park or a campus. And of course, we're here today to talk about the concept of superclusters, which are over much broader geographies. So let's just try and frame the discussion a little bit. And um, 
Chris and Anne, if I can turn to you first. You are representing a, a cluster in Cambridge. So can, can you talk to us a little bit about what you think defines a cluster and makes a cluster work? Absolutely. Well, I think um, it's about the people who are in the cluster <laughs> primarily, and I think it's about whether they identify that they are part of something bigger than themselves um, and that they get benefit from that, and they get benefit of that either through the collaborations that it enables for them or they get benefit through the brand or they, and the talent that they are able to attract. We heard that as an important thing coming through. The, and in turn, they then are um, keen to promote and build and invest in that cluster. Um, and the difference between a cluster and a network, people also do the same things. A network is obviously a cluster is geographically sort of defined. But as you say, they can be at different scales. So again, examples here, we have a heart and lung research institute on the campus which uh, brings together people within a building, but again, quite unusually from different disciplines, industry, academia, charity, all focused around heart and lung. Then we have the biomedical campus. The biomedical campus is one of about nine life science campuses in Cambridge, including the Wellcome Genome, the Abraham Science Park. Um, but then again, in some areas, like cell and gene therapy, we start to collaborate broader than that. I would say we're very strongly connected down to Stevenage, up to Norwich, uh, and particularly when you get into patient uh, research uh, and population base and putting together data, for example, we're thinking about 7 million. So it, I think the scale of the physical cluster depends on the, the, the um, problem you're trying to solve. Um, I do think they need curation. And if I think very carefully about, you know, I think there are five ingredients potentially. One is that they need an anchor, either an anchor idea or an anchor institution. They're a bit like shopping malls with the John Lewis or whatever. <laughs> what is the anchor that sits at the heart of the cluster, which is, it's built around? Um, secondly, I do think you need to think about how you physically uh, enable the architecture, the buildings and the spaces. But more than that, how do you create the opportunity for chance encounters, which are more than the spaces? It, that might be the choirs or the, the dinners or the, the things that sit around. Fourthly, how do you almost sort of encourage people to work together, whether that's around missions, cancer, dementia, the heart and lung I just spoke about, tackling some of the biggest killers um, that are causing premature death in our country today. And finally, though, I think it's also important, the sort of the behind-the-scenes stuff that you do to remove the barriers to collaboration. So how do you make it easy for people to swap employment, share apprentices, have joint appoints, open up their buildings, have the same contract? How do you make it easy for external parties to come into the cluster and get the best out of it? So those are the five ingredients. And I think, ultimately, it does, does come down to the benefit of being able to attract talent and de-risk it for individuals who can, as Steve said earlier, have their careers here. Uh, and and you know, I moved to Cambridge 10 years before I had a job there, knowing, actually that I'd eventually be in this life science space and that there would be a job there. Great, thank you. And you certainly picked up on some of the themes that I think um, Steve uh, Rees from the earlier session was talking about in terms of what it feels like for the individual and the things that they're looking for, that ability to maybe move around in the labour market without having to move uh, everything else in their life. Sharon, if I can turn to you, um, AstraScale had a decision about where to locate, um, and you obviously decided to go to the Harwell campus and, and to be part of a cluster there. Can you tell us a little bit about the decision-making and, and the benefits that you feel that you've, you've had from being within a cluster? I can talk about the benefits of being at Harwell all day long, so stop me when, I, when I've got too far. I, I found your points really interesting. I, I wrote them down, and I, I think they relate to, to our decision to go to Harwell. You know, ESA is based at Harwell. That's a, a fundamental partner for us as being part of the uh, space industry. Um, you know, the infrastructure, the, the architecture, if you like, we had... Um, the ability to go into flexible office space so that we were able to grow. We didn't have to commit to a large space. We didn't have to commit to something. We were, you know, this enabled us to grow and creating opportunities. You know, we, we interact on, on a, a really regular basis, both with the cluster managers there, with the campus management team, with Oxlep, with DIT, 
DBT. We can, we can interact across the board there. And, and a lot of our partners are there. So as we're growing as a company, we're joining up with other people on campus so we can go for bids, that we can, go with, that we can look for business together. We collaborate together. Um, and I think one of the, the key important things for us as well is, is business support. It's people, you, you actually feel that you're part of something bigger than you are. So when you're quite small, you, you feel bigger than you actually are because you've got all of this support around you. And you've got like-minded people. Um, I, I mean, the, some of the drawbacks maybe, I think the war for talent is, I mean, that, that is, you know, described day in, day out. Um, but on the positive side, getting people to move from somewhere in Europe or somewhere in London and come to this gorgeous campus in the middle of the Oxfordshire countryside is really hard to do when you're one voice, when you're talking about that wider network and what the campus are doing to enable you know, next-gen development and things like that, then you actually have a stronger voice. Um, so there, there are lots. I mean, we wouldn't have been anywhere else. I mean, we've just we started in 2017, so we're capitalising on our investment from Japan into the UK. We're now just short of 200 employees. We've got a purpose-built facility, 20,000 square foot, that you know we've worked with the campus to develop. We can now integrate satellites on site. We can fly the satellites from from site, and we wouldn't have been able to do that if we'd have stood on our own two feet. I think. Catherine, I'm sure um, Sharon's reference to business support and creating that environment resonates with you very much and is really, I guess, at the heart of Barclays and Barclays Eagle Lab. So perhaps from your perspective in terms of facilitating clustering, particularly within the SME tech sector base, could you reflect a little bit on what clusters mean for you? Yes, absolutely. And, and just um, for everybody's familiarity, because, you know, I always think everybody knows about Eagle Labs, but maybe you don't, right? So um, we have about 40 different sites around the country. Um, these are set up to be to a couple of different things, right? They are, they are you can hire a desk. You can be one person in, in, a, uh, in a lab saying, actually, I want to work here because I want to be around other people are innovating. Um, I want some of that support. So we put on lots of events uh, locally that either geared towards the needs and wants of entrepreneurs. And that could be, as you say, some lifestyle things. Yes, it could be, actually, maybe we're running a yoga session on a given day. Um, or it could be, actually, let's bring somebody in who's going to come and talk about um, how to grow your business at a certain point. If you're thinking about international expansion, you know, can we bring you some kind of insight from that perspective? So the, the, those labs kind of work on their own independently. And they also work as a network. So because we have these um, 40 different clusters together, actually what we started to figure out is there are areas that we want to specialise in in certain places where there's a natural um, consensus around why you might be there. So uh, as an example, we, have, we set up um, a, a lab, an agritech lab, focused uh, at Lincoln University. It is a working farm. You can bring your technology, you can test it on a farm, right? So you've kind of done your PhD, you've got your idea, and you're like, actually, now I want to see if it works in practice. Well, everything is there to enable you to do that, and you have other innovators around you who are also kind of trying to solve some big picture questions, and actually that collaboration works really well. And we've set up other centers like that. So um, in Cambridge, we are focusing on clean tech. We've got a partnership with Carbon 13, um, and that, again, is bringing together you know, a natural kind of cluster but adding on extra support through venture launch pads, accelerators, um, and those connections. So I think that works really nicely for us. And a live example I'll give you is, um, funny, like, this is a weird, but my um, nephew uh, was setting up, uh, he's trying to set up a business, right? So he's, uh, he's met somebody he thinks is really interesting who's done a PhD in textiles, and now he's interested in agriculture, and he's thinking, can we create a flax industry in Scotland? So off he goes, and he's got his idea, but we're going, okay, well, we'll connect you with somebody in Scotland because we're based in Scotland, and we've got people who can help you with funding. We've also got some insight from our Lincoln Lab from an agriculture point of view, and we're just plugging all this stuff in to help them think about how, what their next steps are. And I think that is, that's the role for us of clusters and joining them together. Uh, it's not just one person with a great idea. Fantastic. Um, I'm sure that idea of, of networking and looking at how you connect over broader areas in the way that you're, you can do with, with Eagle Labs is something that we'll come back to. Um, Isabel, if I can turn to you, um, it, 
you are you have a, a, an astonishing role in terms of strategy for UKRI, and as as you said in your um, introduction, that's you know seven organisations. We heard from Barbara earlier about the fact that STFC has very much driven the idea of cluster development as a core part of the strategy in, in what STFC does. Could you talk to us a little bit more about um, how important clustering is to UKRI? Absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to be clear, STFC forms part of UKRI as one of the, the research councils. Um, so. Uh, UKRI has six headline objectives uh, as published in our strategy last year, one of which is place. Uh, and part of you know, the sort of sub-objectives in that, in that is to support clusters. You will have, um, you will have experienced uh, Minister Freeman's enthusiasm for, for clusters um, <laughs> earlier, I think. Um, so there are lots of ways in which we can do that and ways in which we can support clusters um, through our core funding, because I think that's really important in terms of uh, supporting uh, scientific breakthroughs, but also having uh, a commitment from government to invest over a long period of time is very important for the talent issues that you were talking about, Sharon, earlier. We also uh, we can we can uh, provide project funding. We can also provide um, opportunities for networking and convening, whether that's through. Um, space in our labs and in, on our campuses and I know Innovate UK ran an event in December which was about um, uh, bringing people together th across the cluster. Um, we have, um, we also do, we do other things in relation to um, people, for example, we facilitate the global talent visa scheme to, to enable people to come here from other countries. I, I, I'm not sure whether this the geography is exactly right but I totaled up uh, in 2021, what we spent, what UKRI spent in East Anglia, Bedfordshire, Hertfordshire, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, and Oxfordshire, uh, and it was £1.6 billion. So there's, there's, not, there's no shortage of funding coming from UKRI into this area of the country. Mm -hmm. I think, but I think we, we want to, to support in that way, but also in a convening uh, and networking way, because I think that kind of, um, that softer, um, uh, the relationships between people, which I think has already come out in some of the conversation, are essential for, for making clusters mm. work. So let, let's develop that idea a little bit and, and in the context of how we create a super cluster. So I, I think Sue, um, in her presentation, um, mentioned the concept of a, of a two-hour cluster, and I guess that's sort of getting from one side, maybe Oxford to Cambridge, maybe, um, <laughs> on a good day. Or the other side of Oxford. Um, uh, but, but we're talking about a, a, a supercluster at, at a much larger geographical scale. And if we think about some of our international competitors, I mean, people often talk about, from a life sciences perspective, um, the the... Boston, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts cluster um, with a focus around Kendall Square. But in reality, that cluster is a 200 square mile area, um, which um, geography is not my strong point. But I'm guessing must be, you know, if we're talking about the Golden Triangle, maybe a sort of similar kind of geography. Um, I seem to remember the kind of distances are something like 50, 60 miles, 70 miles or something like that, if you take the different points on the triangle. If we, if we want to take that concept of clusters and all of the ingredients you've talked about, particularly the relationships, the networking, the face-to-face, -face, the engagement piece, which you've all brought out as being so important, how can we take that to the next level on much broader geographies. So, so Isabel, I'll come back to you. You've, you've touched on some of the issues that you thought were important, but can you yes. say a bit more about that? Of course. So, I, I mean, I think that this is it's just a really interesting question because uh, I think what, the way that we should think about the arc is a kind of constellation of clusters rather than uh, trying to, to, to have some kind of gigantic cluster because I think some of the, the local connections um, are really important. 
and I think it's really important for the individual clusters to be able to build on the strengths that they have, uh, whether that's disciplinary or whether it's technologies, uh, in a really organic way. So, and I, and I think uh, your, your point about the size, I think this, the size maybe not is not quite as important as other aspects of geography. So transport links we've already touched on, travel to work areas is really important. <laughs> Um, and you might, you, you know, you think you, you have to think really carefully about um, where where a port might be or where an airport might be, as well as uh, train stations and, and, and roads. And I think I think um, we, again, we've already touched on this, but having having the time and space for for creating networking opportunities, whether that's choir or or yoga classes or uh, or, or just having a coffee, um, is is really important. And, and doing that across from one end of the, the, the arc to the other is actually quite tricky. So I think kind of building those things in, in, in organic sort of mini clusters is probably more sensible. And I, and I also think that um, another really important uh, factor for me in clusters is really strong and cross-sectoral leadership uh, that brings together uh, public, private, uh, voluntary bodies, community bodies. And, and in, that, in, in that leadership, for each of the clusters and for the arc, it's really important that you stay on the collaborative side and don't get into competition of, of my cluster is better than yours because that that will that will you know that will destroy the the the, the, the possibilities. I think. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely reinforce. Uh, I mean, I think Boston has invested in transport, and I'm really pleased to see transport because of, you, you you need transport as the key. But I think it also comes back to this point of creating benefit for people who are in the cluster. So where is the benefit for people, the institutions, the companies, mm -hmm. of being part of a, uh, a broader supercluster and focusing on those, those opportunities, whether that is around, uh, on the science side, science problems that can't be tackled at a scale individually, whether that's the structure of the brain or novel therapies, um, whether it is around training opportunities that we can only gather because we've got um, you know, enough training places across the arts. So I think it's about finding those areas where I like the idea of having individual clusters where there is benefit of working at scale and then providing leadership. And uh, someone came up with a great phrase to me yesterday that you, can, you can't herd cats, but you can move where the food is. Um, <laughs> and this goes to, you know, you've got some of that food. Thing. How do you then put the food to encourage the, the clusters to, to collaborate where there is real benefit? for the individual clusters. And we do a little bit of thinking about that in Cambridge because we obviously have, you know, we, we, we get together as the different campuses. Uh, where is, you know, there's huge focus on genomics at Hinkston. There's a lot of focus on early functional genomics and translational science at the Babraham. The CBC is really about where you can collaborate with patients and at that forefront of getting science into healthcare. And, and so that's what their individual specialties are. But then there are topics like, um, uh, you know, the challenges we've heard about in dementia, one of the, the life science missions where actually all of those campuses need to contribute to, and have something to bring, and then how do you foster that? Can I just add in that I think the other aspect of this as well, so there's a corporate initiative or, you know, the, the science at the centre of it or the, you know, the industrial kind of uh, strategy, there is the piece around you want to make a place that people want to come and live in, right? Yeah. And, um, and the reason the transport's important is because, like, we're all human beings and we can't spend our whole life in a car. I had a very long journey down to my mother at the weekend, and I was like, yeah, do you know what? This is not fun. Um, and actually, if that's your day-to-day -day life, you want to make that easy and slick. And I think you do see examples where, um, you know, I saw an example, actually, at Imperial working with Hammersmith and Fulham Council, where they both have this very clear strategy, long-term strategy about building wet labs, building all of the creativity, but the, full, the council are really clear that they want to bring in small businesses to provide the fun things that make it a nice place to live, um, as well as whatever their strategy is around housing and making that um, accessible. And I think increasingly, I think when we think about clusters, we need to bring that thought process in too. It's the end to end. If I come here with my family, are there decent schools? Does the infrastructure look right? You know, can I put my roots down and stay? Because increasingly, that's what people want to do. 
And another really important factor for me is being able to articulate what it is that you're trying to achieve and, crucially, to your point, what might get in the way, which might have nothing to do with the science or technology. Yeah. It can be all sorts of things. It might be skills, it might be transport, it might be housing, it might be the regulatory environment. But knowing what those things are so that you can make requests yeah. uh, is really, really important. I, th I think the, the key things for us, you know, we're... we're having to recruit from around the world. We've got 200 employees. We've got 28, 29 different nationalities there. You know, the increased recruitment costs after Brexit. Mm. I mean, on the, on the positive side, it's opened up the whole of the world for us because it costs the same whether we take somebody from Germany or whether we take somebody from Sudan. Um, but then bringing people into Oxfordshire and, and, and being able to live in Oxfordshire and to have, as you're saying, to your point, you know, mm. Um, so I think it is wider than just giving us the cluster support that we need. It's how do we enable the ecosystem that we create as well to, to function in that area. And, and to follow up on your point about the sort of the constellation of clusters, which I think is a really great term. You know, we were talking earlier about Westcott, about how they're trying to create a space, a secondary space cluster at Westcott. It's, it's <coughs> kind of... Not easy to access from Harwell because of the infrastructure of the, the roads and everything else. And, and as a, a company, you'll travel further to see a, a, a supplier than you would to go on, on the opportunistic journey to find a partner, which mm. it sounds weird. And, and the more that we could do to support the clusters by enabling a UK supply chain... And, and, and what the implications for that are, whether they're anywhere within the UK, so levelling up and, and you know, we, we try really hard to, to work with a UK supply chain. I think the UK supply chain is also really important to helping develop the clusters. Mm. Yeah. So can I, I just ask you to develop that a little bit further, Sharon, because th this really plays into the spillover effects that can be created from clustering yeah. because you, you start to create sufficient gravitational force, if you like, that, that means that there, there's opportunity for suppliers um, and, and, and they can start to see that. Are you are you seeing examples of that within, within the cluster that you're working within? Yes, I mean... Obviously, we, we've had support from uh, UK Space Agency. We're having support from ESA. And, and one of the key messages that, that we do is for, how, you know, for every pound you spend with AstraScale, what does that mean for UK PLC? And you know, our supply chain is from uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland. Um, we've got a little um, uh, metal work in Derbyshire that, that do certain things for us. And it's quantifying that and, and being able to explain um, and I think it, it enables our conversations with, with government and um, with um, MOD is if you need an integrated supply chain, where are the gaps and where do we need to fill that? And, and we shouldn't underestimate that that is a knock-on effect from a cluster. Yeah. You know, and I think you had some, some yeah, stats. Yeah, I mean, we quantified it for the, for the campus with the help of CEBR last year and have gone on to develop it. But for, you know, every... Um, 10 pounds of operating income on the campus it's 11 pounds of operating income in the rest of the UK for every 10 jobs it's nine jobs in the supply chain elsewhere so I think it's important both at the UK uh, PLC angle and those jobs are across the country and across the region one of the most deprived regions East Anglia the coastal areas mm. but it's also I think we also as we think about creating this super cluster need to make sure and this is where planning does have a really important role actually and I'm not in favor of sort of saying planning is about how do we make sure that whatever we create does work for the people that live there and that everybody does benefit and we're thinking again an awful lot about that in Cambridge some people may have seen one of the most unequal cities how do we make sure that the benefits we're talking about and the wonderful things that are happening really do uh, raise uh, the the lives of everybody in the economy and everybody gets the outcomes of health it makes me really happy to hear the statistics that you've got uh, so easily to hand because I think um, uh, politically, small p, big p, uh, um, levelling up will continue to be really important, whether it's called levelling up or not. Um, and Cambridge is not an obvious place where you would think to, uh, to level up or no, no, nowhere in this arc is. So being able to articulate how the spillover effects are really um, helping the whole country is, is really, really important. Absolutely. And I, and I think one of the things um, it, that, that 
is a challenge that we need to think about is, is how we create visibility around these opportunities, but, but also the challenges. Um, so as there are supply chain opportunities that exist for other parts of the UK, how do we bring those people in and how do we help those potential suppliers to see that there are groups of companies that they could be tapping into? I'd, I'd just like to, before we, we turn to um, convergence, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the issue which you've all touched on, which is around what I'm going to term soft infrastructure. So um, it's, it's the things that help do the connecting. Because um, I think um, I'll, 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 use, I'll use my kind of like my favourite uh, example that I always use. Some of you might have heard me use this before. We are animals and we're extremely territorial. Um, I'm, I'm based in a place called the Wood Centre for Innovation in, in Oxford, um, which has got lots of companies and I regularly you know, observe interestingly groups of people from different companies who'll huddle together on the same table at lunchtime. Um, but I always say, if, if any of you have ever worked in a place, this is probably addressed to the, to the women in the room, I can't talk to the men, I think the infrastructure <laughs> is different. Um, if, if you've ever worked in a place that's got um, uh, cubicle blues, you've probably got your favourite one that you use. And if you go to the loo and you find that somebody else is in it, you're a bit miffed <laughs> about that. And, and that kind of plays to the fact that we are fundamentally territorial and we're driven by the, these territorial behaviours, which prevent us from naturally going and engaging with, with people and, and going and having those conversations at lunch that says, hello, I work at Astra Scale. What do you do? Is you know, so um, Sharon, you've I know before you worked with Astra Scale, you worked for Oxford Innovation, which is very much you know at the heart of creating that soft infrastructure. Could you just give us a few thoughts on some of the things that you think work to help get that interplay and collaboration potential? I, I think what what you're alluding to is that we we. A lot of us have to do networking, and it's not really a comfortable zone for us. None of the, I, you know, I've yet to meet anybody that says, "Yay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some networking." Maybe, maybe your teams like are networking. different. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, so, yeah. I, so I think it, you know, you kind of have to put your networking hat on, and you know, I, I see it across the campus. We go to dish and sit down, and everybody's in the little trestle table and whatever. But, but what I've found um, at, at Oxford Innovation and, and again at, at Harwell is that if you if you go into a, a next gen, I'm a bit old to go to a next gen um, networking event now, but if I go into a normal Connect Harwell or something like that, you just have to get that sort of big breath and go and talk to somebody and say, you know, I'm Sharon, I'm from Master Scale, I've got a really cool job, what do you do? And then you find that everybody else has got a cooler job than you have because they're doing <laughs> things that you never envisaged possible. But I think yeah. it's, it's giving you the environment to feel relaxed enough to do that rather than it being forced, you have to do this. But I, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with you about networking, uh, but, but I think it, it becomes easier if you're actually not networking for networking's sake, but no. networking with a purpose. Uh, so whether that is you are collaborating in order to create a vision for your cluster, or whether you are um, you're, you're kind of you're thinking about sort of forward planning, because as we all know, research and innovation is a long-term game, um, that, and, and clusters take take decades to kind of really get going, I think. Uh, so you know, if you're kind of envisaging what, where you might be in five or 10 years, I think that's, it's easier than just networking for networking's sake, which I, as I, I, I agree with you, is not fun. Although it happens in the loo. <laughs> it definitely does, <laughs> definitely does. Um, Catherine, uh, again, Barclays Eagle Lab, this is your bread and butter, and mm. Nicola Blackwood you know, talked about breaking down silos. 
what are some of the mechanisms that you're using to try and get people engaging and, and to really see that additionality coming out of having a collection of different businesses working under the, the aegis of the hubs? Yeah, so we, I mean, we run a series of different um, opportunities, I suppose. So both from an, edu and there might be well be an education opportunity or a networking opportunity is broadly how, how we'll term them. So um, we run funding readiness programs as an example. So you could be a business from any any sector, but you're going, actually, my next thing is I need to raise some funding. Am I ready? Right? Uh, and that's a program we'll run. Now, we run that virtually, but we also add some components on top of that so that you can kind of network outside it. Um, but what the real power is when we get our um, accelerators going, so we run a number of different accelerators. Um, so we launched this year a, a one for women, which was our first one specifically for women, which was fabulous. And I got to be part of the judging panel there. Also lots of fun. Um, uh, but we have run a series of Black Founder Accelerators uh, and we continue to look at opportunities to do more. We're starting to do more on the scale up side as well. Now, the, the feedback we get from the um, businesses that go through that is... The education is a component, mm. but the value they get from learning from all the other businesses, right? Mm. So this is just about actually, oh, let me see your business challenge and how you're addressing that. Uh, and therefore, actually, maybe I can learn from that, but also maybe I've got an idea and I can help mm. you and you can help me and we can find a way of doing something together. These work really, really well. Um, and the power of the alumni afterwards as well, I think, is, a, is not to be forgotten, right? So actually, I think as much investment needs to go in, in into maintaining that reason for that group to come together to enable that um, as the initial, the initial opportunity. Um, but we see it in lots of different places, not just what we do ourselves. Um, but, um, you know, the one I've mentioned about Carbon 13, they've been running that for a number of years where they're bringing together, actually, um, individuals with different um, sort of science backgrounds but are thinking about clean tech. Um, and the objective is put you together. The, literally, the objective is put a lot of people together and see if they can come up with a business idea together. And at the end of the program, they're given support, but they then sort of figure out if there are any partnerships to be had from this. And these things can't really be done without putting people in a room together, right? They work really well. So I, th I think that very much plays into the themes from Sue's presentation earlier. So if we can just, as, as we draw to a close, talk a little bit about convergence. And uh, Chris and Anne, can I come back to you? Um, what, what are the things that, that you think can really help um, uh, to, to bring people together at the interfaces, whether it's... Uh, different therapeutic areas, whether it's different technologies or whether it's taking you know, a company like Sharon's and maybe seeing where there might be opportunity that, that nobody would immediately think of um, in a completely different area. Um, could you yeah, no that? problem, yeah. Um, I think three things I th we think about. So the physical putting people together closely. So again, talked about heart and lung. We've got another, the Early Cancer Institute, for example, which is combining uh, physical scientists, mathematics, AI, um, also ethics. It's not all about the science. We're entering territories where there needs to be ethics and legal guidance around uh, personalized treatments and putting them all in one place. Um, you know, we we'll later hear from uh, Altos uh, on a panel later who is thinking of doing the same thing, bringing people together who are working towards aging. So putting people together so they do have physically the opportunity. Uh, we talked about moving the funding pots, so creating incentives for them to work together, the, the cat food and, and, and the things I know you've, you're thinking about is in, in UK or I of doing that. And I do, do think actually there's a role for actually thinking about the people who can work at the interfaces, who understand both languages. That's been a key part of my own career of being able to translate. So who are the translators? How are we building those translators who have worked in quantum computing and medicine, how are we creating those opportunities in our training programs and in our apprenticeships uh, of, of people who can act at the, at the interface. And then finally, creating identity and breaking down those territorial boundaries. I was thinking the last question about the power of music and sport. You know, in, in Boston, there was a Longwood Symphony Orchestra going back to Kendall Square. I mean, imagine if we had a, a supercluster boat Rather than the Ox and next year, rather than the Oxford Cambridge <laughs> boat race, we have a super cluster boat facing the Boston boat. You know, create that sense of identity. I don't know. Um, 
Just in the final few minutes, I'm going to take a couple of questions. And um, I, think, I think we do have some roving mics. So um, if some of you have been defeated by the technology and you've really got a burning question, wave vigorously. And I expect uh, somebody will come and thrust a mic into your face. But um, be before I, I take any questions from the floor, I'm going to pick up a couple of the questions that have come through on Slido. And there are lots of really great ones, so I apologize um, for, for those of you whose questions will not be asked. Um, but, but, but one of the questions is, should we be thinking about the UK as a supercluster? <laughs> and Isabel, um, given that you've got UK in your title, I'm going to uh, ask you to address that one. <coughs> Fair enough. I think I think Minister Freeman would, uh, would would talk about science superpower and innovation nation, which is not not necessarily uh, language that speaks to everybody, but is very um, it, it, it's, it's nonetheless powerful. I think um, it, it 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 is um, it is a it's a, it's it's a very tempting idea, uh, and I think it sort of builds out some of the conversations that we've been having about being a supercluster means the being lots of little clusters connected together because the geography of being you know from land from John O'Groats to Land's End you can't you can't have the natural connections that we've been talking about so I think I mean it it, it is a good idea um, but we would need to build it up from lots of lots of mini mini clusters I would say. Kristen Ann I'm, I'm going to combine two questions and ask you um, to uh, to respond to them. Um, so there's a sort of a chicken and egg question here. What, what comes first, the cluster or the people? Um, and um, secondly, uh, let me just make sure I've got it. Do you, you talked about needing an anchor or ideally having an anchor. Do you think that is entirely necessary to get a cluster going? I tend to think it is, but it can be, uh, and I think this is where the people come to. I do think it isn't, there's something there that, to build around. Something has to bring people there to start with that can then be built off. But that, that can be very many different things. It can be an academic uh, university. It can be a facility like the uh, cell and gene therapy catalysts that have been built that people come in and shared space that they can use. It can be a company um, as we've seen as GSK and other places, that then spin off people around it. But I, I personally do believe in the power of something that gets talent there initially that other people can then grow off. I, I, I expect it will be possible to create a cluster without an anchor, but it's much easier if you have strengths that you're building on, uh, which will, have, will then happen much more organically and will be less forced. Yeah. Can I just check, are there any questions from the floor? Is anybody brave enough to wave a hand? No. There we go. Very silent. <laughs> um, so uh, just, just one more question um, from Slido before we, we wrap up. Um, we've, we've talked about um, the, the need to try and encourage collaboration and interplay and, and convergence between companies within clusters. Um, if we lift our head up and look internationally, particularly you know, in the context perhaps as, of um, thinking about you know, Horizon and, and, and where we play in on the international stage, um, what are your thoughts about how we can try and encourage greater levels of collaboration beyond borders? And, and Sharon, if I can come to you, because you, you are an international company, yeah. so this, this must be really a key question for you. Yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're headquartered in Japan. We have a, a US arm and a, an Israeli arm, and we opened our French office last week. Um, so that gives us a, 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 a launch pad, if you like, for extending collaboration. I think potentially within the space industry, it's probably easier for us to collaborate with international partners because we don't have that UK supply chain. We don't, you know, space is quite a, a, a small industry, so we're forced to collaborate. Um, and then, of course, we, we, we do face some barriers both with export requirements and with ITAR and EAR and all of that wonderful stuff. Um, so I, I think for us, we probably have an easier time collaborating just because of the industry we're in and because of our, of our platform. 
Great. Um, sadly, we're pretty much out of time. So if I can just wrap up by uh, trying to pull together a few of the themes, and we've, we've cantered over quite a lot of different areas. Um, I think we recognise that, that clusters can operate at different levels, um, but where they are geographically distributed, the infrastructure uh, and uh, both physical infrastructure and the soft infrastructure that allows people to effectively move around in them and to engage with other people, uh, with other companies, is really important. We've talked about the potential that comes from clustering for spillover effects into um, other geographies uh, through development of supply chains and some of the challenges around how we make that visible um, and how uh, people can see the opportunities that we're creating. Um, and I think running throughout is, is the importance of people. Um, and the fact that we need to recognise that clusters are the places that people work, but they're also the places that people live and are accessing services. Um, and not really something, unfortunately, we had an opportunity to talk about, and maybe, Matt, something for next year's conference. <laughs> but how we really see... Uh, the economic opportunities that are created through science and technology clustering flowing out into groups um, who perhaps are not engaged in what we're doing and, and seeing where those opportunities might lie for them to be drawn in. Um, and I will do a very short plug for a piece of work called the Oxfordshire uh, Inclusive Economy Partnership, which is um, very much trying to look at these questions of how we make the success story um, of science and technology and other sectors indeed work for our most deprived communities. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute treat. I didn't really need to do very much, which was lovely. <laughs> so thank you to all of you for your contributions. Thank you.